Hello and welcome to another episode of AWS Cloud Bytes. I'm your host Bhavesh Kumar. Today we are going to talk about serverless in the cloud and how we can use this serverless to unleash the power of AWS. In today's agenda, we have what is serverless computing, key benefits of serverless, AWS serverless services, and then we're going to talk about some of the serverless architecture examples. So let's look at what is serverless computing. Serverless computing is a cloud computing model where you don't have to manage the infrastructure. It means you can focus only on your code and application logic rather than looking at the infrastructure. The cloud provider, in our case, AWS, automatically handles server provisioning, scaling, and maintenance. It's even driven and pay as you go. So serverless computing, it's a cloud computing model. If you are new to serverless or if you are new to cloud, this will allow you to build, run applications without managing the underlying infrastructure. In a traditional server-based environment, you have to provision the servers, manage their configuration, ensure that they are available and secure. With serverless, you basically abstract all this to the provider. And uh, in this model, you just write functions or you can say the code and then respond to events. These events could be uh, HTTP based event, changes in data in database or any kind of custom event that you can define. When an event occur, the cloud provider, in our case, uh, AWS, will handle the execution of the code. This means um, if you have 100 users, concurrent users, it will scale up to 100. If you have 500, it will scale further. If you drop down to, say, 50 concurrent users, it will scale accordingly. In a traditional computing where you manage your servers, you will have to have that kind of server capacity to allow, say, 500 or 1,000. But in this case, as in serverless, you are paying as you are using the capacity. You pay for only the spike that happened, say a spike happened uh, on a Thanksgiving day, that kind of visit comes to your website, um, those kind of products are being sold. Like in those cases, your spike can be handled if you are configuring accordingly. That's the beauty of going through a cloud provider. Let's move to the key benefits. One of the key benefit is scaling. So serverless platforms like AWS Lambda automatically scale your application to handle any kind of incoming request. Whether it is 10 users or 10 million, as I already mentioned, it can handle without any intervention at your part. So you don't have to intervene to scale uh, in order to handle the incoming request. The second important benefit of having a serverless is that cost benefit. Now in a traditional server-based hosting, you will have to pay for the server instance. And um, in order to fully utilize that, it may be like 50% of the time you're using the full capacity, but you have to over provision so that you can handle any kind of spikes. In serverless, on the other hand, charges are based on how much you use the actual use. So it's cost efficient. Server management. So in this case, uh, when you're using serverless, you are abstracting any kind of server management task, such as provisioning, configuring, maintaining servers, or uh, doing patching on the servers. Any kind of operational overhead around servers is, uh, is managed by the cloud provider. And when I say serverless, um, I'm primarily focusing on serverless services that are in AWS in the context of this particular video. The next benefit is faster deployment, focus on code, and not infrastructure. Since we are not looking at the infrastructure, we can focus on the business. And we can take advantages of all the agile development, continuous integration, and continuous deployment CI-CD pipelines. High availability. So serverless services are designed to be highly available and fault tolerance. They automatically handle a redundancy and failover, ensuring your application stays up and running. If there is a 
a hardware failure or a software failure, in those cases also, your serverless application will continue to work as there will be new instances up and running to handle those kind of uh, issues. Let's move on to what all services are serverless in AWS. So for service that AWS offers in the wide range of serverless services that they offer is AWS Lambda. Lambda is a compute service where you run the code in response to event. The next one, we'll go in detail of each one, but the next one is Amazon API Gateway. Now it is a fully managed service where you can create, publish, and secure APIs. It can be public facing, it can be private APIs. You have step functions, AWS step functions. It's primarily a serverless orchestration of microservices. You can have a multi-step or orchestration of a multi-step business process. Then there is AWS Fargate. These are basically serverless containers. You have two implementation. You have ECS and EKS. We'll talk about those. Amazon Aurora Serverless. This is an on-demand auto-scaling relational database, which is provided as a serverless, like an on-demand database as and when you need, and it scales based on your requirement. AWS App Runner. So this is a fully managed container and serverless service. And another one that I would like to mention is uh, AWS Event Bridge. It is basically an event-driven service for connecting various applications using events. This can be AWS services and your custom services or applications. Let's talk about the first service, which is AWS Lambda. If you use AWS Lambda, you would have seen that it's also, you can call it as function as a service. It's an offering that allows you to run the code in response to events. Some of the key points that AWS Lambda offers is that it is a multi-language support. Uh, you can write lambdas in many languages, such as Python, Node.js, Java, Ruby, and more. And this flexibility allows you to choose a language that your developers or you are proficient with, or your team is having experience with. The triggers that are allowed to trigger an AWS Lambda is an HTTP-based request, database changes, S3 events, you can have uh, DynamoDB events, SNS, and many more. Let's look at the usage of AWS Lambda. They're primarily an ideal service for microservices and for building event-driven applications. Next is just a picture of AWS Lambda. One of the key benefit is that Lambda is stateless. You can have concurrent invocations. The limit right now for uh, number of concurrent lambdas that you can run is 1,000. And uh, you can have some of the limit reserved, but I would not suggest that because lambda will be able to scale for the unreserved ones. So if you have a lambda and you want to scale, you can have a max um, scaling defined so that the max concurrent lambda you run, you can scale it say 10 yeah, when you go for max, but don't reserve it. Uh, when you reserve it, it is also going to have um, input saying, um, if you want to reserve 10 lambdas, and you want to say that bare minimum, I need to have these many lambdas running some kind of a kickstart. In those cases, uh, you will be billed for lambdas that are running, uh, just to give you a head start. Moving on to the next one, let's look at the next slide. Let's talk about API Gateway. Before we jump into the points of API Gateway, I would like to describe what is an API Gateway. So API Gateway is a fully managed service and it is for creating, publishing, and securing APIs. You can integrate API Gateways seamlessly with Lambdas. 
and it allows you to build RESTful APIs for your serverless applications. So it does uh, many things like API creation and management, integration with AWS Lambda, as I all already mentioned. You have security authorization. You can have API monitoring, analytics. You can do rate limiting, um, throttling, request and response transformations. Let's talk about the points. It allows you to create, publish, and secure APIs. API creation, uh, which means you can define an API structure, endpoints, request response mapping. You can create all these RESTful APIs with these. Integration with Lambda, you can have security and authorization, which includes authentication, authorization. You can use AWS Cognito for user authentication or implement a custom authorizer. There are two kinds of authorizers. You have token-based authorizers, you have request-based authorizers. In token-based authorizers, you just receive the access token. In request-based authorizer, you also receive the headers and uh, additional information apart from just the authorization header, uh, which is received in the token authorizer. Now, token authorizer can have a Lambda authorizer attached to it, which means the Lambda authorizer can uh, validate the token and allow you to generate a policy that will allow or deny uh, execution of an endpoint. If you want, if you guys want, I can give you a detailed uh, video on how we can do that, uh, the interceptor for doing the authentication and authorization. It's primarily validating the token, not doing the authentication because you will have access token. We are just validating the token. And then uh, authorization is something that, what all things you can actually execute. So that's what can be done using API Gateway. Uh, the next one is um, API monitoring and analytics. It gives you really good uh, visuals around various metrics, uh, executions. Um, you can have tracing from API. Then uh, this is a good one, rate limiting and throttling. Basically, this will allow you to perform even when there is a there are like inflow of too many requests that your API gateway can handle you can throttle the request and you can even limit the number of requests that are coming in request and response transformation this is primarily when you get a request you can transform you can map it to a different kind of request and then send it to the execution for whatever is handling because you can have a Lambda take that request, you can have any other compute service take that request. And then the response comes back from that particular service, whatever compute service you have, and then you can do the transformation, send the response back. You have good integration with Lambda and other AWS services. And we already discussed about this. It enables you to have RESTful APIs. I have a picture for API Gateway, you can see that an API Gateway can allow you to give the public endpoints that can be consumed by the, by the user of this dashboard, by web and mobile applications, IoT devices, on-prem, VPC, like they can all call these HTTP public endpoints. Uh, from API. You do have an API gateway cache. It all depends upon your requirement, but you have integration with CloudWatch, which can do the logging. You can have um, other event-driven things using the CloudWatch event bridge. And you can see that API gateway can go to uh, Lambda. You have EC2 and other services over here. So API gateway can be your entry point, or you can see a facade where you can have one or more uh, APIs exposed using a single API gateway. I don't recommend it, but still you can have one big API gateway that can have all the endpoints that you want to have publicly exposed. And these endpoints can be from different microservices, but it's okay to have different API gateways. I would recommend having a separate one. Anyways, moving on to the next slide. Let's talk about step functions at a high level. Step function is a it's a visual workflow service that allows you to uh, perform orchestration, and um, this orchestration can happen. You can have a lot of 
steps in the flow because as you can see the name is step function you can have smaller task and each task can be performed independently by a serverless uh, function or a microservice as we already talking about this it allows you to orchestrate microservices and serverless functions you can create basically complex and um, event driven applications using a step function which means the the step function as a function is serverless but you can have uh, each step performed by either a serverless compute or a service that may or may not be serverless so the each step can be serverless which means if you're having a lambda triggering triggered in one of the step it's going to be serverless but if you have an ec2 instance hosting a api that is being consumed in step function it may not be um, it will not be serverless in that case anyways uh, the step function allows you to do a lot of lot more things like handling errors you can um, use the built-in error handling and retries which ensures that your workflow can run and this is a picture from aws we can see that the step function on the left side this is just a description of step function and you, this workflow is primarily what i was talking about each one of the step over here is a separate lambda you can have a lambda to check the inventory and hold the product you can have another lambda that can do the billing you can have another lambda that can remove the hold if the credit card fails another lambda over here that is doing the shipping in case the payment is successful so this is a kind of a simple workflow but you can have a workflow which has multiple steps and the complexity may be really high you can have two or three parallel steps where each step output is then aggregated um, based on however you want to orchestrate your steps so that was all about aws step functions let's look at the next uh, service from aws which is aws fargate well this is not strictly serverless in the traditional sense aws fargate is a serverless compute engine so over here this is all about the containers serverless is running containers you don't have to do any management for infrastructure or container orchestration it's a compute engine for containers and it allows you to run containers uh, without worrying much about or without worrying about the underlying infra and uh, or orchestration between these containers now the next point is about the deployment container deployment is um, fargate allows you to define and deploy these uh, containers using tools such as uh, amazon ecs which is elastic container service and amazon eks which is the amazon version of uh, elastic kubernetes service and um, we do have um, ecr which is a elastic container repository now the repository is where you keep all these images the container images uh, from which these containers are built uh, let's move on to the next which is scaling it automatically scales based on the cpu and memory requirements uh, so whenever you have containers defined which is basically uh, defined as a task in fargate so you can have fargate with the ec2 you can have it with the with a container so there are two ways to have forget i don't remember if there was any third one but ec2 and ecs probably uh, so scaling is uh, where you can um, scale based on your cpu memory requirements and that ensures that your resources are utilized optimally which means if you have a spike these containers can scale to um, handle the spike and that can they can come down based on the the cooldown that you have defined or based on based on whenever the spike goes down the next point is about cost efficiency uh, 
you pay only for the vcpus and memory resources that are consumed so as we discussed earlier all these serverless one of the key features is that you do pay as you go or whatever you consume so in this case also whenever you consume some vcpu or memory resource uh, the billing is around the execution or the consumption of that the last point over here is uh, about isolation so forget provides you a strong isolation between containers and it enhances the security and stability basically having isolation and enhancing security and stability is one of the key features of aws forget let's look at the picture of aws forget so on the left side you have um, a picture which says without forget what all things you have to do you're going to build a container image then you have to have a ec2 or on-prem server where you want to deploy this as a say docker uh, container and then you have to provision and manage the compute resources uh, if you're hosting it as a vm you'll have to have a vm management software which means isolate the application in separate vms and then you have to run and manage both the infrastructure as well as the vms you pay for in case of ec2 you pay for ec2 instances in case of your server uh, you have to pay for um, the capex that you're doing for the server uh, buying the server in case of aws fargate you build the container image similar to what you do on the left side you define a task saying this is the memory and this is the computer requirement these are the computer resource requirement and then you run these tasks saying i need two or three containers running for me based on whatever my requirement or you can say minimum and max and based on whatever your um, usage you will be built around that the isolation is by design the handling scaling is all by design so forget does that for you the only thing that you have to look into is the image that you're using whether it is a window image or linux image in both the cases you have to look for the security uh, vulnerability all those kind of upgrades so those will be required um, because you're using an image that may have uh, some vulnerability that has to be mitigated it all depends upon what your organization uh, base image is so if there are changes in the base image you have to upgrade the base image okay moving on let's talk about amazon aurora serverless so first of all aurora serverless it's basically an amazon aurora database which is a, a compatible mysql and postgres sql uh, database it's a relational database and serverless is just a serverless version of that particular database it has uh, features like it's a fully managed on-demand auto scaling relational database compatible with mysql and postgresql auto scaling is one of the key feature it automatically scales database capacity based on the actual use it is highly available which means uh, it has built-in replication and failover capabilities and i'm very uh, cautious in saying that uh, based on your requirements whether you are going active active uh, active passive you have to be very uh, informative about what database you are choosing and if it is having the right kind of rto rpos that meets your uh, company's requirement uh, the requirement of data loss or recovery time basically moving on to the next one storage scalability the storage of aurora serverless is also scaled automatically um, so if you are increasing um, compute basically if the database usage is more and the storage also grows it will automatically scale the storage pay as you go which is the core theme of cloud computing cloud cloud-based services so you only pay for the database capacity that you're using and the storage that you're using this is the picture of uh, amazon aurora 
I didn't find a picture of uh, Aurora serverless, but uh, the idea is to show you that Amazon Aurora is one of the databases that Amazon provides. It's a MySQL and PostgreSQL compatible database built for the cloud. It's high performance, multi-AZ uh, distributed storage for durability, performance, and fast recovery. As you can see in serverless also, it is flexible and auto scaling compute. It's a low latency cross-region replication. And most of the databases that you will look at in cloud, they are eventual consistency. And you can look for strong consistency. You have to look into the right database for that. Okay, moving on to the next AWS service, AWS App Runner. Now, AWS App Runner is a fully managed service that simplifies the process of building, deploying, and scaling containerized and serverless applications. The next point over here is ease of use. It automates tasks like code build, deployment, load balancing, and scaling, allowing developers to focus on writing code. Compatibility. App Runner supports various uh, source code repositories, including um, AWS CodeCommit, GitHub, Bitbucket. So it makes it um, a really good choice. Um, it is compatible with almost all majority code repos or source code repos. Automatic scaling. The service automatically adjusts the number of containers based on traffic, ensuring your application can handle varying workloads. The last point over here is security and isolation. AWS App Runner provides security features such as integration with the AWS Identity and Access Management, IAM, and strong isolation between applications. One of the pictures that I have for AWS App Runner is from AWS website itself. This one is, um, you can see AWS App Runner. You provide a source and you configure the build and service settings you review and create and it will verify all the settings deploy your service you can have a secure url for production ready moving on to the next um, aws event bridge formerly it was called the cloudwatch event so what are the things that you have in event bridge Basically, when you talk about event bridge, uh, you have schedulers, you have pipes, and event bus. We'll talk about uh, a little bit at a high level, but it's an event driven architecture, and event bridge is an event driven service that simplifies uh, building event driven applications by connecting various AWS services and external sources. The event routing, which is the second point over here, it allows you to define the rules of routing events. So you can say from source to targets, enabling um, a decoupled and scalable architecture. So it's basically, uh, you can say a publisher, subscriber kind of scenarios you can have, or you can have a listener setting, listening to an event. It's basically subscriber. You can have custom events built and uh, it makes our life easy to integrate uh, custom applications and services into this event-driven ecosystem. It has integration with the various services such as uh, various AWS services such as Lambda, SNS, SQS. It enables us to respond to events across your entire application stack. Even bus, um, Basically, even bridge provides you uh, even bus that allows you to segment, organize event flow in your architecture, and it provides you flexibility and control of various events how they are being handled. Replay um, is one of the one of the key benefit I would say. It has native capability um, archive and re replay. I should have said it has native event uh, it says it's SaaS native event so it has native event archive and replay capabilities um, building new application state using old events like you can play the events that happened in the past to get to the current state of your application which is a, a pattern that can be applied 
So you record each event that happened in your application and then you can replay that. It reduces the operational overheads. Um, it allows you point-to-point -point integration between the producers and the consumers. So one of the key services that helps you in binding your or building a near real-time or real-time uh, service using event-driven architecture. The last one is, uh, we already discussed about event pipe. I said that it's a point-to-point -point integration. So you have event pipes. This is a picture of event bridge. You can see that you have services on the left. You have this event bridge. Um, you have an event bus. You can have a default one and you can have your custom event bus. So whenever the events are raised, all these services can listen to the event they can be bound uh, with the event which is coming real time or it can be uh, executed by a scheduler so there can be a scheduled event or a trigger that happens sns aws uh, lambda they all can be your destination now we have discussed some of the services and i wanted to just run through high level examples of some of the orchestration that you can do between these services so in this example, I'm talking about globally exposed Route 53 endpoint. So you have a DNS of Route 53 that you consume, which is on the left side, this one. And you can have multiple regions. So this is, may you may say, region 1. This is region 2. You have API gateway in each region. And your API gateway endpoint is calling whatever endpoint that you have, DNS that is mapped into the Route 53, the API gateway DNS in route 53 yeah, maybe it is round robin maybe it is uh, 50 50 uh, is all set up in route 53 and uh, you have a handler so this whenever that is an execution from route 53 to say region 2 the request comes in request will go from this api endpoint to a lambda that is uh, integrated with that endpoint and that lambda can talk to a database so you can have a primary database or you can have a global database which is basically uh, one of one as uh, one or more which is like multi-master databases or single master database you can have a primary and you can have a replica so this is an example where you can have uh, active passive where maybe a region one is active and region two is passive and there is a failover in case of health of region one goes down uh, say the database over here is not responding or the lambda is not responding yeah, some issue then in that case if the health goes down of region one this can be your active and um, yeah this is basically one of the orchestration which is greatly used this is all serverless route 23 is global service these two are region based lambda is uh, their own instance they are concurrent Wherever the execution comes in, they will just create a copy. There will be a container that is deployed and the Lambda executes the function that you have written. And then the database over here is global. So examples of this particular kind of uh, orchestration will be serverless RESTful API with data storage. You can have a real-time chat application where you can have a WebSocket API. Uh, you can have a WebSocket API. Uh, you can have serverless microservices with API composition where you're, you can have a unified entry point for multiple microservices, uh, which I mentioned earlier that you can treat this as a facade where you have multiple microservices registering one single API gateway to expose their endpoints. You can have image processing and storage. You can use um, S3 buckets for storing the files, whatever file is uploaded from API Gateway. Keep in mind, API Gateway has a timeout of 29 seconds. So anything that is long running, either you have to go through um, a way of um, doing multiple long polling or use another way if you want to have um, constant feedback, or you can just use a fire and forget, which means an async function. You return the response and then do the long polling. Let's move on to the, the next type of uh, example. So this is another example um, where you have a Route 53, similar thing, and you're directly registering your application load balancer. Most of the cases you will try to have an API gateway in place, but if there is a requirement, 
I don't think there, sh there is much need as such to expose the load balancer, um, attach it to uh, Route 53. So one other way is that you have a application load balancer, which is again a regional service. You have application load balancer running, registered to a Route 53, and then you have um, a Fargate cluster attached to this load balancer, and um, you have databases. Now Fargate has multiple tasks uh, based on what you're running. Um, you can scale, you can have one or multiple um, containers within Fargate running. So this is another way of orchestrating the services in AWS. Let's move on to this loss example that I have. So this is more of a, a backend process. Suppose somebody has a file, they drop this file to an S3 bucket. S3 bucket can have a event. So you, if you have read through S3 events, um, you can attach a Lambda, you can have a S3 object lambda also, object function, I guess we call it, which can do some transformations if you want on the data that has been dropped in a particular folder. You can actually have your event built on a folder rather than the top level bucket. And I will not suggest you to have multiple top, line, uh, top level buckets because they are limited resources and you should be very cognizant about how you wanna structure your S3 buckets. Having said that, once you drop the file over here, irrespective of how you want to uh, orchestrate, you can have a Lambda that can listen to the event and it can process your file and do some kind of uh, transformation either using this Lambda, or you can use the object Lambda. Uh, they can also take this file and do further processing of that file. I'm showing that further processing into the second one, like you drop a file, Lambda picks it up, it processes the message and puts it on the queue. Then somebody um, is listening to the queue. This is another Lambda that is listening to the queue. It picks the message and processes it further. Puts in database or puts it anywhere um, the processing requires. Now, there may be questions around this SQS because SQS has a limit of the message size. In those cases, the Lambda can drop it into an S3 bucket and put the URL of uh, or the bucket uh, path in the message itself and the other Lambda can pick it up from there and process it. So it's kind of a overall event driven over here. The next one is a, a scheduled event. So suppose every day you want to run uh, 8 a.m. you want to trigger something. So you can trigger the Lambda using a CloudWatch event. Now Lambda is triggered. Lambda can start the processing. It can talk to database. It can talk to APIs, bring in the data, send it to a queue, or do whatever is required. I'm just showing you that this is also possible. This is one of the way of building your process flow. That is all I have for this particular video. This is the end of the episode. Thank you for watching. If you like the video, please like, share, subscribe, and press the notification bell icon for future updates. This is your host, Pavesh Kumar, signing off. Thank you.